there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I pray for myself right now. I'm asking for myself that you would clear my mind, that you would clear my heart, that you would be clear through me. Lord, would you push away anything else? Would you make what is complicated simple? Would you bring clarity from my voice that the people of God could hear from the Word of God and that I wouldn't get in the way? Lord, I also pray for every person in this room because we know that we cannot truly understand your scripture without the Holy Spirit working inside of us. So Lord, would the Holy Spirit be in every person right now translating, guiding, and helping to understand so that we could be transformed, not just to be hearers of your word, that we would do it and be different because of what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the book of Mark, if you haven't been with us, so that you know where to start going. And while you're getting there, I have one of those questions that doesn't really have a good answer. Uh, it's, how far is not far? Yeah, well, it, I mean, and the importance of this question kind of changes based on what's going on in your life, right? You know, if someone's asked you to move a piano, this is a really important question. Is not far two centimeters, is not far two meters, is not far two houses. Maybe you've shown up and someone said it wasn't far and then your definitions of not far didn't line up. Oh, not far, oh, that's far. I remember when I was running a lot and people would say, how far did you go today? And I said, oh, I'm not far, five kilometers, you know? And they're like, no, that's far, that is definitely far. It's an odd thing, not far. Then it gets even worse. I mean, that's one aspect of not far, but my family, we're going through a visa process. You might be able to tell from my accent, I'm not Australian. And we have a visa in. When it comes to countries, not far is a big deal. If we get a response back and say, your visa was not approved, but you weren't far from getting approved. <laughs> what does that mean? It still means what? No. It still means no. Not far is not there. Not far is still not there. And why am I making such a big deal of this question about not far? Well, it happens to be the pivot point of today's passage. And maybe not a pivot point you would notice necessarily. I'm going to do something I don't know I've ever done before. I'm going to actually start the sermon from the middle. A verse plucked from the middle, and then we're going to build around that, okay? Here's the verse. It's Mark 12, 34. Mark 12, 34. We're going to get to who Jesus was talking to in a second. I'm going to explain all that, but we're just going to start with this not far thing. Mark 12, 34. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. You're not far from the kingdom of heaven. This is not actually a good statement about your position with the kingdom of heaven. Because, once again, like the visa, not far is not that yet. It's not there. So far, Jesus has had a really big day. So let's start describing the day. This day started with, kind of started with yesterday. The day before this, Jesus went into the temple and tossed all the people out that were selling and buying and made a big scene and pretty much spent all day doing that. Worked up a sweat, kicking people out. This morning started with showing up to a withered fig tree, then showing up at the temple, then the chief priests, who were pretty mad about everyone getting kicked out yesterday, challenges Jesus and he answers it. Then the Pharisees come with this big question, Jesus handles that. Then the Sadducees come and ask him a question, he handles that. And now he's on to the next person who's going to ask him a question. It's been a bit of a day. Now, each of these people that have questioned Christ have had some bad answers. The chief priest challenged Jesus, but in the parable that Jesus gives right afterwards, this is what Jesus essentially says to the chief priest. You're condemned. God's going to destroy you. Not a good message. 
I can see why they weren't happy with that one. But the Pharisees', Pharisees his response is, you hypocrites. Lovely. With the Sadducees, his response is, greatly mistaken. Well, we're getting better. We've gone to, I'm going to destroy you, you're hypocrites, to you're greatly mistaken, I can be greatly mistaken, to not far. This seems to be a positive progression. But the bottom line is, is that the person not far is under the same judgment as the person said in the first case, God's going to destroy you. Unfortunately, it's still the same. So we got some, I think the first question we want to ask are two questions, and we're going to get to more. First, we're going to find out, why did Jesus say you're not far? So what, what happened first to make Jesus say that? And then, does Jesus answer the question of, how could you be far enough? I think he does. So before we go any further, we're going to look at those two things, and we're going to go a bit further than that. Everyone with me so far? Excellent. All right, so let's start with... That what had got him to this not far coming. We're going to read Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34 for that one. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. Yes, they've been arguing all morning. And recognized that he had answered them well. And asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered and said, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and that there is no one else besides him, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. <laughs> All right, let's figure a few things out. Let's start with, maybe you don't know much about biblical history, so very briefly, who are scribes? Who are these people that are scribes? And ask the question. Uh, scribes um, had a job. Their job was to copy the scriptures. They weren't a political party like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And they didn't have to belong to a specific family like the priests did. And they weren't in a political appointee like the chief priests. They were just people who copied the Bible. Now, that was a really big job. It was a very intense job. Imagine this. Imagine you are handwriting the entire Old Testament. That's already just a nightmare, right? But imagine, when they're done, they do this math, complicated math stuff where they count and do things to make sure that every single character is perfect. And if the math doesn't come out, if it's not perfect, they burn it. Can you imagine working for months and months and months, painstakingly cramping writing, and if you make a single mistake, they burn your work. And you can start over. They had a pretty intense job. They had an eye for detail. And their entire job was simply to write the scriptures, so they knew it pretty good, as you might imagine. I think I would know pretty good if all I did was write the Bible over and over. So this is who this guy is. What's his motive? Well, it would appear that his motive is genuine. Everybody else so far has said something like, and hoping to trick Jesus, they came up with this question. Of course, this has failed every time. It's not working well for anybody. <laughs> but this guy is listening. He, he doesn't have a prepared question. He, he doesn't have an objective to trip Jesus up. He's just listening to the argument. And he's listening to Jesus respond. And he's impressed. He's like, wow, this guy's doing pretty good. So he throws one out of his own. Hey, Jesus. It doesn't look like his motive is, is uh, mean or derogatory or trying to shut Jesus down. It doesn't look like any of that. It just looks like he wants to ask a question. And what do they discover? 
in this conversation. They discover a commonality. They discover a shared belief. This hasn't happened yet in the discussions this morning. Everybody who has questioned Jesus has not agreed because of Jesus. They have not come to any commonality. And yet here they've come to some kind of agreement. He asks Jesus what the greatest commandment is. He probably has a pretty good idea of what the commandments are. There's a lot of them, by the way. And Jesus' response is excellent. We're going to get later to the depth of that response. Not yet. But here's some key things that they agreed on. They agreed on the nature of God, that God was one. They agreed about the relationship God wanted to have with people. God wanted people to love him, not just fear him, not just tremble, not just those things, not just, oh, I, I'm afraid my crops won't grow, so I'll make a sacrifice to some capricious, weird God that may not even like me. God wanted a relationship with people where they loved him. With everything they had, they agreed on that. And they agreed on the relationship God intends between people. They agreed on those things. And you know what? If a person lived by these two standards, let's just think about what they would be like. Loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Loving others as ourselves. Well, what are those people like? Generally, people that are widely admired and respected across the world. Gandhi might fall in that category, right? Does Gandhi's religion, genuine, sincere, does he care about what he does? Does he come off as plastic or insecure or insensitive or, or in, what any of those things? I don't think he does. And he tends to love people. How about Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama? These people are genuinely liked. They're nice. They're nice people. They're people that most people would enjoy being around. Following these principles will make you a benefit to your community, a great neighbor, and generally someone people respect and love. Period. Even if the God you're worshiping isn't the right God, living by these principles will generally engender respect and around the people you live around. And it does mean that if these are the principles that we espouse as the most important, Christians should be a benefit to their community, great neighbors, and people who are generally respected and loved. Because that's what happens when you live that way. Whether you're even worshiping the right God, that's what happens if you live that way. That's just the outcome of living that way. So this scribe is, in some ways, light years ahead of those who have spoken to Jesus so far today. The chief priests were more interested in their own authority than they were in God's authority. The Pharisees were more interested in controlling people than loving people. The Sadducees had no eternal perspective, so they'd become completely self-absorbed in their own comfort. But this scribe understood. The scribe had figured it out. If this scribe was at all living what he said he believed, he was a nice guy. You would have liked him. You would have wanted him as a neighbor. He would have been someone in your neighborhood you appreciated that was in your neighborhood because he was a good guy. But he was still missing something. If he wasn't still missing something, Jesus would not have said in verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. So what was he missing? And this is where it gets a little more difficult. Let's read between verse 35 and verse 37. And Jesus answered and began to say, as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies under thy feet. David himself calls him Lord. And so in what sense is he his son? And the great crowd enjoyed listening to him. If you're lost right now, don't panic. Because this is a riddle. 
It was meant to be a riddle. It is a riddle. And because it's a riddle, it's not hard. It's hard. Not only is it a riddle, it's a riddle that neither Mark nor Jesus explain. So sometimes when Jesus gives parables, we get an explanation, and other times we don't get one. This is a riddle to which we are not given the answer. But can we answer it? I think we can. But this is where you're going to have to stay with me because it's not an easy riddle. I'm going to rephrase this question maybe in a way that would be easier for, you, for us to understand. Essentially, it reads, Why did David, King David, who lived a thousand years ago, when he wrote a psalm by the power of the Holy Spirit, say, God said to my Messiah, who will be my descendant, Sit at my right hand until I put the enemies under your feet. But when he said that, he referred to the Messiah as my Lord. And that's the, that's the puzzle. Why did David refer to his eventual descendant as his Lord? That's the, that's the bit. This... And I skipped something, so go back with me. Why do I think that this is answering the question about what he said about the scribe not being far? Let me explain that really quickly. In verse 28, we see that it was a scribe that came and heard them arguing, and that it was a scribe that asked the question. And then when Jesus makes this response, he, he directs it at who? The scribes, in verse 35. Why is that important? Because the belief that the Christ, the Messiah, was going to be a descendant of David wasn't just held by the scribes. It was held by everybody. He could have just as well said, why did the Sadducees believe that Jesus is the son of David? Or why do the Pharisees believe? Or why are the chief priests? Could have been anyone. The fact that he says the word scribes means this is what he's doing. Hey, oi, don't go anywhere. I have a question back for you. By saying... Why do the scribes, he's, he's pulling this bad guy back in. <clears throat> I'm talking to you still, don't go anywhere. This is for you. So that's why I believe Jesus is answering his question. Or answering about that gap. Because he's readdressing the exact person that just talked to him. He's still in the conversation. Jesus hasn't let it go. Sorry about that, I missed it. So here we are in this question. This riddle. It's important, and we can figure it out. Have you ever, how many of you like riddles? How many of you hate riddles? Any hate? Okay. Those of you who hate riddles, what do you always want? Yes, the answer. Uh, you don't want a hint? No, no. no we just uh, want the answer. Okay. Maybe those of us who like riddles want the hints. All right. Jesus gives some hints before the riddle. So let's look at the hints. Because maybe that'll make the riddle a little easier, okay? There's some hints before the riddle. We're going to go over those hints. Here we go. This has all been the same day. This has all been to Jesus. For us, it's been several weeks of sermons. But for Jesus, this has all been the last hour of conversation, okay? It all goes together for him. We need to look back just a little bit. When Jesus was talking to the Sadducees, Jesus explained God's eternal nature by reminding us that he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the burning bush. And so we were reminded about God's eternal nature. Jesus also made a big deal about verb tenses. I know that's pretty nerdy, but here it is. He said, Sadducees, the reason you're wrong about eternity is because you should have noticed that Jesus said, or God said, I am the God of Abraham. Abraham died. But I am the God of Abraham. If I am the God of Abraham, Abraham still exists. Therefore, you should believe in life after death. For I wouldn't have said, I am the God of Abraham. So Jesus has already, today, built an entire argument on a verb tense. I know that's kind of nerdy, but he's done it once. So we need to recall that, because he's about to do it again. He's about to make verb tenses important again, and we not need to know that. But he's already done it once. That should have primed our pump. Number three. Earlier in this, his discussion with the scribe, Jesus reminded us of the unity of God. He said, the Lord our God is one. 
not multiple, one God. We're going to need to talk about that in a second, too. Those are some hints going into the riddle. So like I said, here's the riddle key start translation. How does it work that the Messiah, the promised hero of the Jews, who is to save them from their enemy, is predicted to be a descendant of King David, but King David referred to the coming Messiah as his Lord, present tense. He's his Lord right now. How is it that David is saying in the Psalms, God said to my Lord right now, and then he talked about what that person would do in the future. That's his question. It forces us to ask a question about who David would refer to as his Lord. Who is worthy to be David's Lord? Well, he's the king of Israel, so nobody in Israel. Any other king on the entire planet would be an equal, so nobody else either. So no human being gets to count. Anyone who is his descendant wouldn't be his lord. They would be his descendant. And they certainly wouldn't be alive yet. The only thing, the only person, the only being that David, King David, could ever refer to as his lord would be God. That's the only person that meets the criteria of David saying, my lord, in the present tense. Because the only Lord David had was God. So Jesus is trying to, to get the scribes to see something really difficult. He's trying to get them to understand that the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Jewish hero that was to come and save their people, was actually God. He needed them to understand that, and he told it to them in a riddle. And what do we know about the Messiah from reading Mark? Well, it's Jesus who healed the sick. It's Jesus who cured the blind. It's Jesus who cast out the demons. It's Jesus who forgave the guilty, made every standard ever written about the Jewish Messiah. So who's the Jewish Messiah? Jesus. And if the Jewish Messiah is God, then who is Jesus? He's God. In this riddle, here's what Jesus has packed up. I'm God. I know it's complicated. I know I didn't just shout that out to you. But that's what the answer to the riddle is. The answer to Jesus' riddle about King David and going back to the song and everything is, I'm God. Not only that, he's done a primer on the Trinity right here. He's like, well, are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's reread this, understanding the answer to the riddle and what this all is. Let's reread this. Verse 35. Oh, sorry, verse 36. David said to himself, David himself said, in the Holy Spirit. So by the power of God the Holy Spirit, God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand until thine enemies are beneath my, thy feet. The Trinity is right there. And yet Jesus just reminded him and agreed with him that God is one. And so he's talked about God as one like two, like a sentence ago. Like just now. And now he's just said, God the, God the Holy Spirit said to God the Father to do that. Through that, talked about God the Son. It's all right there. Poof, there's the whole trinity. The section ends with a great crowd enjoyed listening to him. Of course they did. Why did they enjoy listening to him? Because he was making all the smart guys look really stupid. All the people that normally made them feel stupid are made, made look pretty bad right now. And the whole crowd is like, oh, look at that guy go. Nobody can answer his questions. This is really fun. And so they're watching the important people squirm, and the great crowd is pretty much enjoying it. I don't think the great crowd understood a word he was talking about. I think they were pretty lost. This riddle is an answer to the man who is not far from the kingdom of God. Why? 
Because the answer to the riddle is what takes a person from not far to citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It's what takes a person from light years away from God to citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It takes everybody in the citizen of the kingdom of heaven when we acknowledge and accept that Jesus Christ is God, Lord, and Savior. When we understand his identity and we love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, that's what takes us from not being a citizen of God's kingdom to being a citizen of God's kingdom. And so Jesus makes it clear. Buddy, I love where you're at, and I love how you're interpreting scripture, but you have a missing piece, and I'm going to give you a riddle that answers that piece. It's not an easy one, but if you unravel this riddle, you have everything you need. You will be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now that we've unraveled the puzzle, though, there's still a few other implications and applications we need to think through. One of the things we might want to talk about is how we perceive people. I've gotten pushback in the past about um, why do Christians believe that everybody was born evil? I've met some really nice people who aren't Christians. Have you ever gotten that, had that conversation with anybody? Can I just acknowledge that there are really nice people that are not Christians? Yep. Can, can we do that? I mean, that would be ridiculous. It would be totally ridiculous for me to stand up here and tell you that the only nice people in the world are Christians. <laughs> that's, that's not actually, that's not true. That's even close to true. Sadly, I've met a lot of Christians that aren't nice. <laughs> Well, that gets puzzling, doesn't it? You have some really nice people that are not Christians. These people are Christians. They're not nice at all. Nice does not equal acceptable before God, though. That's right. And getting that and understanding that is really important. I was I was grasping for some sort of analogy that would make it easier to talk about this. My wife trained to work in an operating room. That's what she did. She could make so much money, more money than me. She could. She could make more money than me. Anyway, she trained to work in an operating room. And here's the thing about an operating room. It's a sterile place, right? Okay. I want you to imagine a little kid, a little girl, is in an operating room. It was an accident. She's in there. It's, it's, a, it's an unusual thing. Mom and dad both hear about it at the same time. Mom and dad run from work to come to the to the little girl, they want to go in the operating room because they want to see their daughter so badly. Dad is a butcher. Dad shows up with pig guts on the apron. He shows up with gunk on his boots. He shows up smelling bad and he hasn't really washed his hair in like three days. And he shows up and he wants to go in the operating room. What are they going to say? No. Mom, on the other hand, just came back from the job she has at a kindergarten. Despite the fact that she works with kindergartners, she looks fantastic. Her clothes are pressed. She has a little bit of perfume. She smells flowery. Her hair is done nicely. She looks nice. She smells nice. She sounds nice. Is she allowed in the operating room? No. Both of them will kill the child. The amount of niceness or outward appearance of their cleanliness has nothing to do with whether or not they're carrying germs. Sin is a germ that we're all born with. Everybody is born with the germ of sin. We're dirty with it, we're filthy with it, we carry it, we breathe it in, and we breathe it out without Christ. It doesn't matter how nice you look on the outside or whether you look like a pig butcher, it doesn't matter. And we can't bring that into the presence of God. We can't. Yep. And it's so hard to help people understand that if I tell you that you need God, I'm not telling you that you're not nice. Maybe you're really nice. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're clean of sin. It doesn't mean the same thing. 
This man that talked with Jesus was probably a really nice guy. But he couldn't make the transition into the kingdom of heaven without acknowledging who Jesus was. And without that acknowledgement, he didn't get in. Period. Because not far is still not there. Without faith in Jesus Christ, not far is eternally not there. Here's our second problem. For those of us who have recognized and submitted to the truth that Jesus is Messiah, and therefore we believe that Jesus is God, and we have accepted what God has done for us, and we have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and all those awesome other great things, let's go back to that part about why aren't Christians always very nice? Let's go back to that. How are we doing on the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? And you shall love your neighbor as yourself part. <coughs> you know, uh, I had the kids up here, and we talked, we talked about being nice to each other, and we talked about it being more important to love God. You know, we can, we can treat our friends like gold, and yet somehow go all week without giving God any attention whatsoever until we manage to get back to Sunday. And yet that's the more important command of the two, that we would love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. But how are we claiming to give that verse any honor at all if we only manage to think about it once a week? Those are hard questions. I mean, all of my heart and all my soul and all my strength and all my mind and all that, whoo, I mean, I don't even, that's hard to even fathom. But if there isn't at least once a day, am I getting anywhere close? To all? Here's some hard questions. Are we more interested in helping alcoholics or criticizing alcoholics? Are we more interested in feeding the poor or carefully determining which poor are worthy of our help? At any given moment, are we more angry about drug addicts ruining our town or brokenhearted by the substance abuse prison that they're trapped in and the impact on their kids and the self-loathing that they must occasionally experience when they're finally sober and they're having to deal with that life? and they're looking at themselves in the mirror, and they hate who they are. Are we brokenhearted about the life they have to live as a drug addict, or are we mad about how they're ruining our neighborhood? Would we rather win an election or one person to Christ? If we saw a same-sex couple kissing at Federation Park, would we be too disgusted to invite them to church? Where would we be if God had been so disgusted by our behavior that he hadn't called us by his Holy Spirit to be washed by the power of Christ? Are we known in our community as people of genuine, pure, intense devotion to God who also exhibit unconditional compassion and care for every person we meet? And if we don't have that reputation, why not? Why don't we? The reputation of a church is often a truer test of its character than we would like to admit. Where reputation contains any of these ideas, we have a problem. Here they are. Angry, unforgiving, judgmental, exclusive, controlling, guilt-mongering, superior, insincere. If someone would describe our church that way, we have a problem. Look, they can say they disagree. That's okay. They can say, look, I don't believe what they believe. Got that. But if what they say about us is they're judgmental and haughty and proud. I, I can't see how loving other people like ourselves could result in these kinds of attitudes. I'm not talking about watering down the truth of Scripture. Scripture. 
I'm not talking about changing God's standards of right and wrong. We should never, ever, ever touch God's standards of right and wrong. They are what they are, whether they're hard or not. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about how we treat the people who aren't meeting those standards. And guess what? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're everyone you meet. They're us. But we have a tendency to say that the people who break God's standards like this, I hate, and the people who break God's standards in this area, I like them okay. Is it ever so that the people of God who accepted the identity of Christ as God and live as citizens in the kingdom of God? Is it ever so that these people are so much more than mere? do a worse job of loving God and loving people than some of those around us that are merely near. When we study, started studying the book of Mark, there were two themes that were identified, two ideas that Jesus used. But let's go back just to Mark 1 real quick and we'll finish up. Mark 1, 15. This is at the very beginning and and I explained then that these would be the themes that we would find over and over. We would discover that Mark kept crushing down on these themes. And here is, and I just want to help us remember that. Mark 1, 15. This is what Jesus said. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. We've been talking about the kingdom of God today. We've been talking about what it takes to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. We've been talking about what it means to be a citizen. And then in Mark 1, 17, he put the other half of, of the theme of Mark. He said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Mark has stayed true to his purposes. Mark is still talking about the kingdom. Mark is still talking about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. You know, in the last couple of weeks, I've, I've talked about how we look at the decisions that we make and the currency of, of heaven has come up. What's the currency of heaven, according to this passage? Love. The currency of heaven is love. The value of heaven is love. Jesus said, here's this. Here's all the commandments. Here's all the things God cares about. You want to know what God cares about? He cares about how you love him, and he cares about how you love other people. And if you're looking for how to judge whether our actions have value in the kingdom of the heaven, then the key ingredient that we're looking for, the currency, the standard, is love. Is this an action that's loving or not? It is definitely loving to share the gospel. It's the most loving thing you can do. It's loving to do a lot of other things, too. A lot of other things, too. My challenge to us this morning, church, is that as the people of God who are citizens of the kingdom of God, that we would do our transactions in the currency of God, that we would love God better and better and understand that we're not there yet, but we would re-examine and rethink and reevaluate and say, is my life actually dedicated to loving God, or is it something I managed to squeeze in from time to time? And number two, do I really love my neighbor? Or do I like the nice people? Anybody can like the nice people. It's not hard to like the nice people. Loving our neighbors is a heck of a lot harder than that. That's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus sets a standard here that is so simple to explain that I can explain it to children, and yet it's so hard to live that we can spend our entire lives every single day examining what we do and discover that we have so much further to go. Lord, if there's a person in this room that doesn't know Jesus, there's a person in this room that, that is not a citizen of the kingdom of God, no matter how near they may feel, would you impress upon them the truth? that they must acknowledge who Jesus is. Because this is the only way to become a citizen of the kingdom of God.
to acknowledge who he is and to accept the payment that he made on our behalf, that we might be cleaned of what it is that infects us. Lord, would you be with us as individuals and as a church, Lord, people who are members of the body of the Christ that I may never see again, but they're here for this moment. Lord, whatever they go to, whatever situation they're going back to, whatever their weak holds, would you encourage them? Would you challenge them? Would you grow them? Would you tweak that perspective just a little bit more? That they would find their lives a little bit more in alignment with who you are and how you want us to live. Because this is your design for the word of God. That would penetrate into our hearts. Convict us of what it is that isn't quite right. And encourage us and move us forward into how we're supposed to live. Lord, we won't, don't want to just feel bad about yesterday. We want to live better tomorrow. Lord, would you make us pursuers of what is great, not just regretters of what was bad. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.